screen doesn't turn off halfway through again. That was annoying. All right, hit the lights. Yeah. We figured it out, everyone. Yeah, we actually figured out how to dim the lights this time. <laughs> All right, so welcome everyone to lecture two on localization. We're basically going to be teaching you how to make your car finally actually see things. So before that, a few announcements. Uh, as you all saw, assignment one was released last week. Assignment two, the gambler signal, is now posted, and it will be due Tuesday, November 8th. You can find it on the slides. We'll also be sending an announcement after this lecture. Uh, the first work session is going to be on Sunday, October 23rd, from 3 to 6 p.m. in the IEEE lab. And if you haven't already, please accept my Discord friend request. I like friends, and also I need to make group chats with y'all. Okay, so, with that being said, here's our goal for this lecture and for you guys to do in the next assignment. So, suppose you had an image of, for example, a die. And our goal is basically going to be to count the number of dots on this die using solely a bunch of image filters, the different processing techniques, and a little bit of creativity. So first of all, we'll talk about what localization actually is. And it's basically just finding things, except using a computer. Because for us, when we look at, at something, whether it's a di uh, the, the, the dice or something else, it's easy for us to tell this is a die. We have, the, um, we have a brain that can process images for us. But to a computer, it's all just numbers. It looks something like this. And just like how you guys would probably see a bunch of numbers and be like, yo, I don't know what that is, uh, the computer is pretty much the same way. <clears throat> so there's two big problems with computers and actually you know, reading like a bunch of numbers. The first is the concept of a large image space, which basically refers to the fact that too much data in an image is hard to read. So just like how if you looked at a page and it had like 900 different numbers on it, you probably, your eyes would probably just like glaze over it. You wouldn't really notice the big picture. It's the same for a computer. We typically only care about the big features of an image, and with computers, they don't really pick up, pick up on that if the, there are too many numbers to look at, too many pixels. The second is the concept of visual noise, which basically refers to the fact that different colors can be confusing to a computer, and images can be simplified by flattening the color space, which basically means taking the 16 million possible colors and sort of consolidating them. Here's an example. So we have this first image from the previous slide. This has 16 million possible colors that can be represented by the pixels in the image. This is an um, image that's been produced by sort of flattening it down, so there's only 2,000 different colors that the computer has to process. As you can see, there's, a, there's not a significant amount of difference in the two images, but the computer can tell that this one, the computer has a much easier time reading this image than that one. So we're going to talk about the different ways you can actually like flatten this image down and how else you can convert the image into a format that's easier for a computer to read. All right, so the main tool that we're going to use uh, in, in all this is called convolution. So how many people have actually like used convolution before in classes? Oh, OK. A lot more CS majors than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so convolution. Um, this is what convolution means in math terms. So this, the top one is a one-dimensional convolution uh, in like continu for continuous signals, and the bottom one is for discrete signals. Uh, we're not really going to be using this like whole ma this mathy definition, um, but what's important to get is like this intuition of the flip and the drag. So if you look at this here, uh, GIF or GIF, go with GIF. Um, we are convolving this uh, square signal with this little triangular signal. Uh, and the first thing to note about convolution is that it's commutative, so it doesn't matter what order you do it in. But, so let's call um, the square signal um, F and the triangular signal G, G of T. Um, what we're doing is we're convolving, is we're, uh, is we're convolving it, um, or we're convolving the triangle by the square. So what we're going to do is we're going to flip it, and we're going to drag it across the, um, the square signal. And at each point T, we're going to take an integral of the product of the two signals to get the amplitude. So, so let's just plug in some values uh, and just kind of get a like conceptual idea. So for t, um, so if we or if we're taking the convolution right is with respect to t. So if we say set t to be zero, um, first thing we're going to do is we're just going to we're going to leave the square function unchanged. Uh, then we're going to take 
this, um, this g of t, which is the triangle. Um, and since we're integrating with respect to tau, and we have negative tau, we're going to flip the triangular signal. So as you can see here, uh, the signal normally looks just like this, with the flat end on the right, or on the left. Um, and now on this side, or on, down here when we're actually convolving, we have flipped the triangle. Now, then what we're doing is we're shifting the triangle by t. Um, so since we say want to say figure out where it is at t equals zero, right? We flip the triangle and then we bring it and we shift it t, uh, zero, which is where this gif starts, right there, where um, they do not overlap at all. We're going to take the product of the two signals, um, so it's going to be. Uh, so since they don't overlap at all, that's going to be zero. Uh, and as you can see, when t is zero, the um, the signal is zero. Uh, we can also look at this uh, later on. So say when t is equal to 4, uh, we'll have shift the triangle over by 4. So now it overlaps exactly with the rectangle. And then we take the product of the two signals, right, the product, and we integrate it over infinity, we're going to be getting a much higher number, which looks to be around like 35 or so. Um, in discrete space, this is like the same, except for the t is continuous. Um, so here, t is n, and n is an integer. Uh, are there any questions about this? OK. All right. So how does convolution work with images? Uh, so instead of convolving an image with an image, we're really just convolving an image with a smaller image. The smaller image is usually called a kernel, a mask, or a filter. These terms are used interchangeably. So if you hear that, that's basically what's going on. Now another interesting thing about images is they're two-dimensional. So that means we have to update our uh, convolution equation to include that extra dimension. Now, this looks a little bit scary, um, but you don't really have to think about it like this. Um, the, the best way to think about it is that you're just taking the kernel, you're flipping it, and you're again just dragging it across the image. So you're going to flip it, and then you're going to align it, say, with this top part, and you're going to multiply each number in the kernel to get the output at that one point. So here we got a more static term. Um, here we're multiplying this image with this kernel. Um, now this kernel's already been flipped, so we don't have to think about that. And we're just going to align each term up and multiply them together and then sum them to get this output. Right? So we're going to take 1, multiply it by 1, we get 1. This gives us 0, this gives us 1, 1, and 1. So add this together and we get 4. So you guys on that side able to see? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, all right. So why is this important, um, and how is this helpful? Well, what it does is it lets us like isolate certain parts of the image and search the image for features uh, and extract them. It also allows us to do a bunch of other cool things uh, to the image, like blur effects, which we will talk about later. Um, all right. So we're going to do a quick example. Um, so if we have a matrix and we convolve it by this kernel. What is the first step going to be for convolving this? Yes? Flipping the kernel. Flipping the kernel. <coughs> flipping the kernel. All right. So we flip the kernel. Uh, and then what is the next step? If, we, if say, we just want to take the first, the first spot, like the, the, or get the first term. Do you know what we would do? Yeah? I guess you'd like take it and multiply it by the top nine. Yeah, yeah, perfect. We'd align it with with that that top uh, upper left hand corner um, of the of the matrix, and we take all these numbers, and we will we're just going to add them. Yeah, we're just going to add them. So that gives us three. Um, so as a quick exercise, can anyone? There's going to be three other numbers in the output. Does anyone <coughs> want to take a guess of what one or does anyone want to say what one or two or all three of them are going to be? 9, 12, 15. 9, 12, 15. I think, I don't think that is slightly off. Right. Um, so for the first number, right? Oh, wait, hang on. I shifted too far down. Oh, yeah. All right, do you want to try again? Uh, well, one of them is 15. One of them is 15. I can add. Addition yes. is hard. Yeah, one of them is 15. Addition is hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so, yeah, so for these, right. all right, so this is going to give us uh, three as the first number. And then the next numbers are going to be 10, 10, and 15. Right? We shift this over by 1. 
4 plus 4 plus 2 is 10. Uh, and then here is going to be 2 plus 8 plus 0. And this is going to be 4 plus 2 plus 8. OK. So that was a lot. Um, we're just going to do a, a few, or I'll take any questions about this whole process. Um, this is, sorry. I don't know, it's like, is matrix convolution familiar with them? Uh, yes, it is. So how do you align the matrices the other way? Because it seems uh, like we just yes. kind of fit it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One. So if you want to do it commutatively, right, you, uh, say you want to take this and do it by, or and convolve <laughs> it by this. Again, we flip it. So we like flip everything. And then the only, uh, so this, first of all, kernels should always have odd side lengths, right, because we can't center it. So this is four, um, which isn't helpful. But So let's just pretend there's an extra, like, dimension here. So we're going to flip everything. And then right, the only like prerequisite is that um, they, over, they overlap. So the center, if we're adding in, would be this 3 right here. OK, so in order for the 3, uh, or in order to position the 3 so that this would overlap fully with this, the 3 would be right here. Right, so we have the 3 here, and this kernel, uh, which is this thing, which is now the kernel, um, would basically be this 5 by 5 grid that would extend past here. Which would, uh, sorry, the, the, sorry, this three would be right here. The three would be right here, right? And then you would have this five by five grid. And since you flipped it, now um, this number would be, this number would be three, um, and then this number would be two, this number would be one, like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. I can try and draw it out probably after the lecture, if you want. Yeah, the main thing to notice here is not that like, it's not really important to remember all these complicated integrals and summations and whatnot. Just to just it's sort of just important to understand the intuition of what exactly is going on here. You're basically taking a kernel, flipping it, and basically moving it around the bigger matrix and just doing the multiplication to sort of consolidate those values into one value. And the idea of consolidating values into one uh, value in a new image is really important because that's like the basis for almost all of our image processing techniques. Are there any other questions? OK. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Are there any other constraints? You just said the kernel had to be odd. Um, uh, the kernel, um, not really. So the kernel just has to be odd, right? Because you have to like center it on a, on a pixel. <coughs> I guess like if you want it, you, it doesn't, all right. It doesn't like technically have to be odd. It has to be odd if you want to like maintain the, the, the dimensions on the output. Obviously, we're not doing that here, so it doesn't matter quite as much. Um, and in the context of image processing, our kernels will typically have to be odd because you have to be able to have that like feature of being able to consolidate the values into one specific pixel. Whereas if your kernel is like an even evenly like, has even dimensions, then it's going to be like your sort of consolidated version is going to be somewhere in between two pixels. Like um, when you try to position when you try to map it onto a new image, which is not really what we want. Since they have to be able to correspond exactly to a pixel in the new image the kernel has to be able to center exactly on a value in the original image. So if I, in this example, this pixel right here is corresponding to that pixel in this. Um, Which is in this example, we're, um, we are losing some information. Like we're not centering it on these ones. Um, there are ways to, like usually what you'll do is you'll pad the image with some like extra values. And there's a bunch of different techniques for doing that. Um, which, you know, I can talk, can talk about them later or not, or you can look them up. Um, but basically, you know, there's, if, you, if it's even, there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the pixels in this image and in that image. Okay, uh, we're going to... All right. All right, so now that all the map is out of the way, um, here's what we can actually do with convolution. So first of all, we talked about our first major problem with the uh, computers we're looking at images, and it's that we have a large image space. The solution to this would be to downscale the image, which seems pretty intuitive, but it's actually a fairly complicated process in the context of how the computer does it. It's essentially a convolution, except instead of stepping the like instead of moving the kernel by value by value, you would like say this is your entire image. You start the kernel here, you consolidate these into one value, and then you move the kernel over to the next value so it's not overlapping with where it was before. In this way, basically what you're doing is you're averaging the pixels in a certain region, 
to consolidate them down to one pixel in the new image. And if you do that to like distinct regions that don't overlap, you'll essentially create a new image that has all of the data from the original image, but it's not like represented in the same sort of size, if that makes sense. So the area interpolation algorithm is typically how we would do this and how OpenCV handles downscaling. And basically, like I said, you have to generate an appropriate window, which is your kernel size. And the way you do that is by calculating a scale factor from the original size to the output. In this case, our original size is 6 by 6. Our output is 2 by 2. So the scale factor that we would determine would be a 3 by 3 kernel. And you can get that because like your original thing has area 36. Your new thing has area 4. So you get that by dividing but down by 9. And um, to have uh, to, to be able to like consolidate down by nine, you would have to have a three by three kernel. Three by three is, has an area of nine. And then once you generate the appropriate window, you just average the pixels in your window, and that's pretty much it. So next, the uh, more complicated problem is reducing noise. <coughs> so first of all, it's important to talk about what noise actually is. It's basically just we think of it as these like graphic artifacts in an image. You can tell like you've probably seen deep fried memes of JPEGs that like have a bajillion different artifacts in them and the <laughs> colors are all wonky. But basically noise is just any sort of random variation in the colors in an image. As you can see here, we have a picture of our homie Albert Einstein. That picture has very noticeable noise. But if you take, a, um, take this dice, for example, the noise is not really as noticeable because it just looks like what the normal environment looks like to us. But the problem is that computers will typically detect features in an image or detect like the foreground and whatnot, they do so by looking for regions with similar pixels. And if all of the numbers are a little bit different, the computer doesn't really know what to look for. It can't, the computer can't reliably tell you that the color, the color with value 254 is the same as the color with value 235, even though to us they probably look almost identical. So the goal here is to minimize the variations in these individual pixels while preserving the variation from the foreground to background. The foreground being our die here, and the background being this uh, table that I put the die on. So if you take this photo, how might we accomplish this? Does anyone have any ideas of how we can reduce the variations in the pixels without making them like completely uh, blend together? Here, I'll give you all a hint. So uh, back in ancient Greece, I believe it was Plato who once said, what if I told you we could represent any image with only 256 unique pixels? I'm not sure how they had pixels back then, but I believe this is a real quote because the internet told me so. But now, keeping in mind that you have 256 pixels in the image, does anyone have any idea how we might consolidate all of those colors into 256 different pixels? Sorry, I wasn't raising my hand. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Convert it to a GIF. A what? A GIF. <laughs> a GIF only has 256 unique colors. You're right, yeah. but that's not what we were looking for. Aww. Convert it to grayscale? That is correct. So basically, if you convert an image to grayscale, you're minimizing the variations in the colors because now there's only 256 of them. You either have zero for black or 255 for white. However, the variation from the foreground to the background is still visible. As you can see here, the dye is still visible against the background, even though the colors are so much like, even though there aren't as many colors with which to actually distinguish them. So we haven't actually lost any significant value from this image just by consolidating this down from a 16 million color gamut into 256. And the question now is, is this enough? And of course, I wouldn't be asking if the answer was yes. So suppose we had an image. Um, I want to make sure that you guys on this side can see this stuff. Is it visible? Yeah. Okay, cool. So suppose we had an image like this, this picture of a die. I've zoomed in on one of the edges just so you guys can see. But as you can see, there's a bunch of different regions of color here. There's that really light region up here where my shadow's pointing. There's like this line. And then around this region, there's like a Y-shaped thingy. I've outlined them in red so you guys can see the actual different regions. This is what a computer would see when you actually like tried to process this. Each red blob is a region of similar color. The computer would see this, and this doesn't really look like the edge of a die. So the computer is still not going to be able to figure out what the die actually is or what's there in the image. 
So what we need is a way to sort of consolidate these regions, a way to blur some of these regions together. Does anyone have any idea how we might do that? It's a trick question. The answer is we blur the image. So basically, as you can see, I blurred the image, and now the sort of um, zoomed in edge looks like this. You have a light region on that side, a lighter, uh, um, different light region on this side, and in between you have a dark region that sort of clearly represents the edge of the dye, and suddenly it looks a lot more uniform. All right, so there's a few different types of blurring uh, methods. Uh, this first one is box blur. It's super simple. You're just going to convolve, uh, convolve a kernel with that just has like, um, it's just as a, it's just a grid where each value is one over um, n squared, so everything is normalized. Um, so here's a here's an example um, with my cats, and they're they've been blurred. Um, now box blur can sometimes create like some sort of like boxy-ish artifacts, um, so. That is like one kind of concern. Um, does anyone know why we're not just using a grid of ones when we convolve? Yes? Like if you have nine squares all with value of 255, it'll still give you a value of 255, so it maintains your color scale? Mm. Yeah, well, yeah, basically it'll just oversaturate everything, turn everything way too bright. Um, so this is why we normalize everything. There is another type of uh, blurring scheme, which is called Gaussian blur. Uh, and Gaussian blur is also a filter uh, where, each, where each pixel is weighted, but it is weighted <laughs> using the Gaussian formula um, where things near the closer to the pixel are given heavier weight than things further away. Now you might be saying that Gaussian function is infinite, uh, and that is true. Um, so there's a little bit of a, there's a rule of thumb that you, cut, you want the, length, the side length of your kernel to be about 2 pi times the standard deviation of the Gaussian that you were using. Um, also, if you plug this into OpenCV and just don't give it a standard deviation, it does a calculation for you, and there's like a weird formula that it uses that is somewhat like doing that. Um, yeah, so this is what Gaussian blur looks like. So here's an overview of just kind of what each of them looks like, where uh, box blur, you're just kind of taking everything in a box and weighting it evenly. Whereas Gaussian blur is weighting the things closer to that pixel more. Any questions about this? All right. Cool. So the question now is, is this enough? And of course, since we're, or most of us are STEM kids, nothing is ever enough. So let's move on. What else can we do? The problem is, uh, as we uh, mentioned, we have 256 colors in the color space, which doesn't seem like a lot considering we brought it down from 16 million. However, it's still too much for a computer to figure out. So after Plato said that thing about 256 colors, his good student Aristotle said, what if I told you we could represent any image with only two unique pixels? This is roughly five minutes after Plato, though it was written in some scriptures in ancient Greek. Um, but anyway, does anyone have any idea how we might actually consolidate a, an image from the entire grayscale spectrum to only two, diff do two different pixels. Any ideas? Which is like a threshold value, and you just either push it higher or push it lower. Very good. Yeah. Basically, we just make every pixel black or white. So <laughs> what we've done is we've minimized even further the color variations, because now it's just all black or all white. And we've still preserved the variation of foreground to background, because we can still clearly see the image. It's a little bit, it's a little bit uh, spotty, and so there are a few artifacts, but for the most part, we can see that there's a die there, and it looks pretty good. So the question now is, how do we do that? And the, there are a few techniques to do this. They're all, they all fall under the sort of umbrella known as thresholding. The first technique is simple binary thresholding, which is what, uh, what, what he said. Basically, for every pixel, you compare its value to a constant threshold. If p is greater than the threshold, you turn it white, uh, which is just the highest value, 255. Otherwise, you turn it down to zero, black. And again, on almost nothing of value is lost because you can still see the die here against the background. However, there's a problem with this. Does anyone have any idea what it might be? All right. Oh, we got an idea. Oh, I was going to say, anything that's similar in color to the background might get completely lost. That is a problem. But we'll talk about that later. 
So one of the uh, main problems with this is suppose we found a threshold. We've, um, typically, this is done by experimentation, just trial and error, trying different values and seeing what works. So here, when I was processing my image of a die, I basically um, I have different windows here for like a threshold of 100, 120, 140. This threshold in the third image, it seems pretty good. You're, we're able to separate the die from the background. The top part doesn't really matter. We can crop it out if we need to. But the point being, um, the die is visible against the background, and there aren't too many artifacts like there are in this one. So this threshold is pretty good on this image. But it's a constant threshold. So the question now is, what if we apply it to any frame? And the answer is, not all frames are created equal. So when the lighting changes, when the, diff when the environment in the image changes, suddenly the threshold stops working. And as you can see here, our <coughs> die is now completely invisible because the entire environment is brighter than it was in the previous image. There we go. So like, as you guys can see, the, in this image, the bottom part is super dark. It's like shady. So you're able to see the die against the background on the threshold. But now that we've made the entire region more bright, suddenly the threshold stops working. So there's a solution to this that some genius computer scientists and computer visionists came up with. Uh, we'll call them computer visionaries, actually. Probably and mathematicians, to be honest. Hmm? Probably mathematicians. Honestly, to be honest. probably mathematicians. <laughs> Fine, we'll call them visionaries, too. But basically, the solution is adaptive thresholding, which basically means for every pixel p, you calculate t based on the average, or the Gaussian sum of its neighbors. Uh, this is entirely up to you. You can pick whether you want to use the average or the Gaussian sum. But basically, you calculate t such that it's representative of just the sort of region around the pixel you're looking at. And then, if p is, your pixel is greater than the threshold, you push it white. If otherwise, you um, push it down to black. And as you can see here, what this is basically doing is you have the die. You take a region large enough around it, like let's just say this entire region. Um, most, for the most part, when you take this region and, have, and you try to adapt, you calculate the adaptive threshold, it's going to include enough of the background such that it'll have some of the dark values and your, threat, your die will always be brighter than the background. However, when you're actually comparing the like, background to itself, it's going to be, uh, it's gonna be like, all the same. The average is going to be pretty, like, it's the average, the pixel is not likely to be higher than the average of the uh, background because you're comparing background against background, which basically means the background is going to be pushed down to black and the foreground, which is gonna be brighter in most situations in the background, that'll get pushed up to white. As you can see, it's not perfect, but it does, it does the job a lot better than the second threshold we saw with the, where the lighting changed and it just immediately collapsed. So there are a few pros and cons to this, as I'm sure you would have noticed by now. The pros of simple thresholding, as the, the calculations are faster, it's just a very basic compare every pixel. And you get more precise control on a given frame, because you can trial and error for that frame and pick a threshold yourself. However, the cons of this is that now you're susceptible to these environmental differences, and it requires calculating many, many different threshold values yourself in order to basically make sure that it works for every frame in your camera input or video or whatever you're processing. On the other hand, adaptive, adaptive thresholding handles these environment differences automatically, and there's no real calculation needed on our part because the threshold is calculated by the Gaussian function or your average, whatever you're doing. However, it's a little bit slower computationally because these calculations are more expensive, and it's not really as precise as if you were to tune a threshold really well on a given frame and just apply it. So the verdict is typically adaptive thresholding is going to be the right answer, but you should look at the environment of your images. And if you are very confident that your, like, camera, your um, video or camera feed or whatever is going to have the same environment throughout, then a simple threshold might work. But in general, adaptive thresholding is recommended. So now, real quick, let's take a step back from all of this and we'll look at the bigger picture, so to speak. So, so far we've assumed that image filtering is most effective with intensities, which is what grayscaling does. So you basically take the brightness of the image, which is what we're referring to as intensity. And typically this is fine. The color isn't really always important. However, this begs the question of what if the color is important? So what else can we do? And in this part, we're going to want the colors back. So we're going to look at what we can actually do like, with the colors. However, before I do that, I just realized I forgot to ask if anyone has any questions about thresholding. Oh. Uh, 
How do we choose the standard deviation for the, the sigma for the Gaussian noise? Typically, you won't choose the standard deviation yourself, but like if you wanted to, you would do some math for it. As Cameron said, the standard deviation is typically dependent on the size of your kernel. According to that function, I believe you said like 2 pi times the a kernel. Well, um, I think OpenCV is something a little more OpenCV will typically handle that for us. OpenCV being the library that we'll use when we're actually like implementing all this. So you won't need to worry about calculating the standard deviation. You just need to know your, like, you just need to generate an appropriate kernel size and work from there. Any other questions? All right. So now, um, part four, we want the colors back. What can we do? So what you'll realize is that RGB is not the only way we can represent colors. Uh, there's another scale called the hue saturation value color scale, which I'm sure anyone, anyone who's played with like a graphic design software or something like that, you've probably seen it in one of those menus. But basically, it, the hue saturation value scale represents color in a different way. So instead of having three distinct like channels that all correspond to the color, you have something where basically the, the shade, the actual like color is determined by just one value, the hue. So this will tell you whether it's red or blue or orange or green. It's like um, on this color wheel, for example, red would be zero and then uh, whatever is like, you just sort of spin around the color wheel. And since it's a circle, red is also gonna be the highest value of 255. And then saturation is gonna be the amount of color in the pixel. What this means is that when you have no saturation, your value is just like a really neutral gray. And then if, you're, if you have max saturation, your pixel is just gonna be the color itself according to the hue. And the value is, to, is also known as like the brightness, where zero is black and 255 is the color itself. So a value of zero would result in a completely dark pixel, which means there's no color there, like no brightness rather. So why do we care about all this? The reason is in OpenCV, RGB triples are separated into distinct values. You have your red channel, your green channel, and your blue channel. In, in contrast, HSV represents these colors as just one value, which is just the hue. So it's easier to filter them out. As you can see here, in uh, OpenCV, like with an RGB scale, your purple to red range would first start at 0, 0, 255, or rather, um, this is blue to red, I guess. But um, this would be like 0, 0, 255 for all blue. And your maximum, like your, the end of your range, would be 255, 0, 0. So you kind of have like two different values that are changing when you try to like separate out the, that range of color. Whereas in hue saturation value, the same uh, region is going to be like uh, one eight is um, the hue. The, the numbers don't really matter, but it's going to be just one constant change in your hue, while the others, your uh, saturation and value, will stay constant, which really helps when we're trying to filter things out by their color. So the question now is, when do we use this? And the answer is, use hue saturation value when you have a foreground and a background that are completely distinct colors wise. Like if you are able to use colors to separate out a foreground then that's a good sign that you should be using HSV. And when the colors aren't really as useful, like if one of your things is just white or black, or if you know, it's just like not really, you can't use color to filter out, then you use grayscale and intensity filtering and what we talked about before. <coughs> so now, like for an actual example, to filter by hue, the first thing you do is you blur it, then you find the correct like hue range. You can typically use an online color picker for this, but there are, things, there are tools online that will tell you what the hue values are for different sort of colors. Uh, then you keep the saturation and value at the default range, which would be 0 to 255, which basically ensures that you'll sort of contain all the saturations and values in your range. And then, so now when you do that, you only have a hue that's like being filtered and your saturation and value are just uh, anything is fine, which is typically what we want. And then outside of that range, you just turn off all the pixels to black, turn the pixels that match to white, and you'll get something like this, where you have your original dye, you have um, separated out the like black, ba the brown background in this case, and basically anything out anything outside of the range of color that's specified by this um, this brown background would be filtered out. In this case, I had to apply like a sort of a flipping operation to change the back to change it from white to black because you can't really it's kind of hard to filter the color white using hue saturation value, but you can obviously remedy this if you are if you have a constant colored background. You can just sort of filter out the background and then flip it. 
And then optionally, you can also like threshold the result if you think that'll help further. Typically, it's not necessary, but it can help at times. So a couple other things you can do with these thresholds, whether these are hue saturation value or just your simple like for adaptive thresholds from before, uh, you can actually apply the basic Boolean operations in the context of images. And what this means is you can do different things to combine thresholds, to flip them, or to like actually combine them with images later. So at the top, we have the bitwise or operation, which basically means you take two thresholds, and the bitwise or operation will sort of combine them so that it's um, one threshold whose um, result is sort of like the union of the two. And this is similar to like the actual Boolean or operation, where if either of your values are one, then your output is one. In this case, if either of the values at a given point are uh, white, then your result will also be white. The not operation is used to flip a threshold. So like you take something that's um, a black background, white foreground, you flip it, you get a black foreground, white background. Sometimes you'll use this if you wanna, like, like I said earlier, if you wanna filter out the background and then set and then select the foreground based on that, you can use the, you can apply the filter to the background and then flip it. Whereas if you want, if you had to like filter out the foreground and then select the background for whatever reason, you could also do the same thing. And then finally, if you want to mask an image, which is basically when you sort of apply it like a threshold on top of the image and just select the region that's not, that's like covered in white, you'd use the end operation, which looks something like this. You take the original image, which was beautifully drawn in like five minutes of Microsoft Paint. Uh, you take your threshold, which is now this uh, white region around the middle. And when you combine the two, the, um, it basically just keeps whatever values were in the original image for the white pixels. And for the black ones, it just turns them off. So now here's another example of how you can actually like apply this. So here we have an original, the original image. Uh, this, these are my two water bottles. Um, so I use HSV filtering to threshold the red bottle and the blue bottle separately. So you can see the top is the red one. This is done by just getting the hue ranges for red and filtering them out. The bottom one is going to be for blue, which is the same process, but for the blue hue values. Then you can combine the thresholds using the, both the OR operation. And then once you mask the original, you get an image that looks like this. Any questions so far? Um, I guess, I mean, maybe, maybe it's not as dark, but on like the bottom right of that picture, there's a little bit of red here. So, right here. Okay, let's say, let's say for example, mm -hmm. that that red hue was like caught by, was maybe like a little bit brighter. So that, that would also be white in the picture? Yes, but what you'll notice is that because the um, red in that corner is sort of like super dark, the computer, in terms of like storing its hue value, it'll basically treat it as like a purple. Because the actual like sort of tapestry in the background is blue, and it's like sort of a red blend into that. So the hue values for purple are like slightly off from the hue values for red. And therefore, in my thresholding, I took careful effort to only take the like strong reds, like my water bottle, and filter out the things that are close to red or red adjacent. And what you'll get is if you like tune that enough, you'll get something that looks pretty reasonably accurate. And we're just going to talk about what happens if you get stuff you don't want to. So exactly. It's going to, yeah. Okay. yeah. All right, so quick summary of everything we've talked about so far. We're not done yet, but um, we just wanted to summarize like the main thresholding techniques. So we talked about how you'd filter things using the grayscale. You basically start with an original image, you downscale it, grayscale it, uh, blur the image, and then apply a threshold. When you use this when the color data is like not really relevant or it's typically just hard to use precisely. We talked about the differences in simple and adaptive thresholding, where simple thresholding is faster and more precise, but adaptive thresholding will actually handle differences in the environment for you. We also talked about the HSV filtering pipeline, which is basically you start with the original image, downscale, blur, then you separate out the hue of what you're trying to select, and then additionally you can threshold at the end. And when you use this when colors will effectively separate your target object from the background. Are there any questions? Cool. So now we're going to stop talking about thresholding for a while. and. All right, so now we're going to talk about blob detection. 
All right, so first of all, what is a blob? So we got our mask, right? And it's masked out everything. So some, some things are white, some things are, are dark. So a blob is just gonna be like a continuous block of pixels that are all touching each other. So we got like six white, and here we care about the white, so we're, we care about the, the six white blobs. Those are our blobs. Um, but now we want to like find the find these dots and, and do stuff with them. So how do we do that? Well, we're just going to count the white regions. It's really easy to do, uh, especially with a uh, image that's as beautiful as that one. Um, you guys will be able to do that during your lab, by the way. So yeah, and OpenCV basically just does that for you. But there are some issues, right? What if your image looks like this? You've got some weird white dots in your in your black dots. You've got some black dots in your white dots. You know, it's it's just you know not not great. But you will notice that all these little noisy things are really small. Um, so what can we do about this? It makes things pretty nice. Oh. All right. There we are. OK, so we've got a couple more uh, operations we can do. Erosion and dilation. Erosion basically just um, shrinks all the white stuff, and dilation shrinks all the black stuff. So what we can do is we will erode, which will um, <coughs> shrink all the white stuff and hopefully get rid of the white dots inside the black dots. Can you guys in the back see this? Um, see the dots in this image clearly? Then we will dilate uh, to bring it back to what it was before, uh, just now that the, all, the, um, all the little uh, white specks are gone, they won't come back. Then we're going to dilate to get rid of the black blotches and then erode everything back. So uh, how does this work in, in practice? Um, well, it's similar to convolution in that you've got like a kernel, uh, which is also called a structured element because of math reasons. Um, and, and you're, again, moving this along the image. Um, however, instead of uh, taking the product of each item and then summing them together, uh, erosion is just going to find the minimum value pixel, so like a zero, uh, and dilation will just take the maximum, which will be a uh, which will be a one. So in the binary images we were looking at, basically you'll just be like, all right, is there a, if you're, if you are uh, eroding, you're going to say, is there a black dot within like six pixels of this? And if there is, that pixel is black. Um, now, since this is happening on a pixel scale, um, right, like each time you do it, you're just like eroding like, you know, a, a few pixels. Um, OpenCV will have an option for you to do this like, multiple times. So you'll erode and you'll say, I want to erode, you know, with a <coughs> kernel of size five, you know, seven times or something, and it'll actually, you know, work out. It's doing it once, I don't mean, shade like two pixels off. Okay, so here's an, a great example. We've got this original one. And now we erode away all of the white dots. The white dots are gone. All the black dots are bigger. That's not great. Have no fear. We dilate everything back. Uh, and then we can dilate it again to get rid of the black dots. Uh, and now these white dots look kind of scuffed, but that's OK, because we can bring them all back. And ta-da, all those little dots are gone. Amazing. All right. Are there any questions with erosion and dilation? Yes? Does the order of eroding and dilating matter? As long, I mean, as long as you do, as long as you can do dilate, erode, erode, dilate, or erode, dilate, dilate. That should be fine. Just make sure you don't like make some of your blotches super big and then not restore them. The main point to notice here is like after each erosion, we also dilate back, and after each dilation, we also erode back to make sure that our original image is left unchanged, but the actual, the super tiny dots are gone. All right, uh, now this gets rid of all the tiny dots. Oh, sorry, here's an overview. This is everything on one slide. All right, now this gets rid of all the tiny dots, but let's look at this example. It looks like we had a shadow. There's probably a light source coming from like that up corner over there, looks like there's a shadow. Uh, now we've got this like massive blotch right here. Um, we can't erode and dilate that away. Oh no. But there are some properties that the blobs that we care about all have in common. They're all around the same size and they're all circular. And we can use these properties to like identify them and know that those are the ones we care about. So what we can do is we can filter our blobs by size and we can filter them by circularity. These are the two we care about. There's actually a whole bunch of operations uh, that you can do, and we're all going to go over those too. Um, but these are the ones we're going to care about for a lot. Anyway, so let's start talking about them. Area, super simple. How many, if you're caring about white pixels, how many white pixels are in the blob? If you care about uh, black pixels, how many black pixels are in the blob? Color, you care about white pixels or dark pixels? You know, you don't want to be looking at dark blobs when you care about uh, white blobs. Circularity is really cool. 
Uh, you can detect the circularity of the blob by using the fact that a uh, circle has the least perimeter for its area. So basically, you just use the ratio of its area to its perimeter to determine the circularity of a blob. Um, and so that's the equation right there. You don't actually <coughs> have to use that too much. You're mostly going to be doing it with uh, trial and error. But I think that's super cool. Um, there's a few other things. Uh, convexity, which is like how convex a blob is. Um, I thought, again, really interesting how they got this, you know, they use this. Um, so basically, you just take a convex hull of your blob, which is the smallest convex shape that can completely enclose a blob. So here we have a horse-shaped blob, and this is the smallest convex shape that we can create that will completely enclose the horse. And then what we do is we take a ratio of the area of the horse, and we, or we take the, the, the area of the horse, and we divide it by the area of the convex hull to get a ratio. So the larger the ratio is, the more convex it is. Uh, so clearly a completely convex blob would have a ratio of 1. There's also a ratio of inertia, which you can calculate, um, which is kind of can be thought of like how, how elongated a blob is. Um, and the important intuition here is you're looking at the uh, moment of inertia if you were to rotate a blob around a axis that passes through the center of the blob. So if you so um, if you remember the you know, uh, moment of inertia from physics, uh, that has to do with the uh, distribution of weight and how far the weight is from uh, the central axis. Um, and this is a ratio. Uh, so it's the ratio of the minimum uh, moment of inertia uh, with the maximum moment of inertia based on the axis you choose. So if you were to have, say, a blob that was just a straight line, um, the minimum moment of inertia would be an axis that just followed that line, because then you'd have zero inertia. But if you would then take a line that was perpendicular to it, you'd have much higher, but the ratio would be zero. In contrast, if you were to take a circle, um, and you were to, then the ratio would be the same, because regardless of what axis you choose, it's going to have a ratio of, uh, or it's going to have the same moment of inertia, so the ratio would be one. Um, so that's like the important intuitions for that. We're probably not going to need these for the lab, but they're super cool. Um, all right, so yeah, this is what we just talked about. Uh, this is what's going to be important for the lab, erosion and dilation, uh, and then also filtering by area and circularity. Um, I think, yes, are there any questions? Yes. Uh, how do you decide how many times to erode slash dilate? Because you had mentioned that you would do it like for example. <coughs> so yeah, you just got to try it. Okay. Yeah. Try so a bunch just, of numbers. Yes. If, um, t yeah, you can start by like guessing one, and then if it erodes too much, you would like reduce it. We suggest keeping track of the values that you pick, like either by commenting your commenting out the line and then adding a new one, or the more preferred way would probably be like have a spreadsheet or a document or something, just to make sure that like you know what values work, what values don't. If any of y'all have done MicroMouse, this is something similar they tell you to do for like PID tuning. You keep track of your constants and stuff. This is basically the same process, except your constants are going to be like these thresholds and different uh, values for everything. Any other questions? Yeah, so for the HSV thing, like like I've toyed with it before, and like when it when you like kind of go outside and the lighting changes, it just like goes to shit basically. So like is there any way to deal with that? For HSV? Yeah, like like the color filtering thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like when you go outside, like the lighting changes slightly, like I've noticed it like completely messes it up. Mm. Yeah, so the thing about HSV is that the lighting, like how bright something is, is only going to affect the uh, saturation and value <coughs> sets, like um, pixels in the, or channels in the pixel. What that means is like your actual hue will typically not change too much just by lighting alone. That's sort of just like how the system is designed to separate out the like hue, the color from the rest of the information in the image. Um, so what that means is if you're filtering by just color, you would want to set your filters such that they accept a small range of hues, but the maximum possible range for saturation and the maximum possible range for value. This means that regardless of how the value changes, it'll still be accepted into the like filter as long as the hue meets the certain criteria that you set. Also, like, what is the context that you were like doing this in? So like, it was like a balloon popping robot. Okay, and then, that's um, kind of awesome. Like yeah. yeah, it would like go like go search out balloons by color. Uh -huh. But the thing is, um, when we like did the contest, I'd like move outside. So like at the mm -hmm. last minute, I was kind of adjusting my filters because 
Um, it, it's like what you guys showed, like with the black and white, and that's how like it found it. It would like target the large white regions. Right. right but right. when I went outside, like it just completely failed, and like the screen was messed up. Oh. Okay. And well, it was showing like a like, whole screen of like white, basically. Right. Okay. I mean, it seems like it just got like totally like oversaturated because the camera right yeah. still reads things in as RGB. Mm -hmm. We then convert them. Um, but if your RGB values are all 255, um, like, you know, your HSP is, you're not going to be able to distinguish between the different views. Um, yeah, so if you're, like, if it does get oversaturated from a camera perspective, there's honestly not much we can do besides, like, have better cameras. But um, typically that won't be the case. Your camera will typically be able to read the data well enough to, like, distinguish color, like, something, like, distinguish color from, uh, I guess, something that's just proper white, even if the colors are washed out. Uh, you, you'll, you'll probably have seen like cameras where the pic pictures are super washed out and oversaturated, and they, they have this distinct like ugly look that um, we, prob we typically won't have to deal with that. But if that does happen, the solution would be to basically like make your thresholds a little bit more lenient, and then try other techniques for filtering out the object. Um, for like, the So it's it can it's sort of like a filter. I mean, you're not manually. There's like a function open CD. If that's what you mean, like in the actual implementation, you're just going to be calling something um, that that will do it for you. Um, but yeah, it, like it's just a it's like a filter, and that you can think of it like a convolution. It's not really a convolution, right? Because uh, we're not like multiplying all the like values. Like we're not multiplying weights and then uh, summing them up. We're just selecting like it's just like a minimum or maximum function. So it's not like actually. Okay. Yeah, so that's a good point. We will talk about the assignment right after Paul's question. question. Oh, yeah, I was just going to ask, like, what kind of lighting environment will the car be in? Um, the car, we <laughs> haven't really figured that out yet, but it's not, we're going to give you, we're going to give you that information with sufficient notice. Right now, the racetrack is currently in a random classroom in Boulder Hall. Okay. And we're probably not going to do our actual racing in there because the room is really small. But we're going to figure that out. We'll get you guys that information before you need to know it. But as for the lab two, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. All the information about the environment and what assumptions you can make will be in the assignment. Okay, thank you. So yeah. Now, um, any other questions before I start talking about the assignment? All right. So for assignment two, or no, there's no slides on it. I forgot to make them. It's fine. Um, for assignment two, basically what's going to be happening is you're going to be doing what we did in the slides. You're going to take a die or a couple dice, and you're going to put it in front of the camera, and you're going to have your pi count the number of dots on the die. And the way you're going to do that is by basically creatively stacking these different uh, filters and other techniques that we've taught you guys. So in OpenCV, which is like the library we use for image processing, it's a Python library, basically all of these different filters and stuff are basically encapsulated by a single function call. So what, you, what that means is it's, it basically amounts to sort of like a drag and drop, uh, not really drag and drop, but like pasting in a bunch of different functions, changing the numbers a bit, uh, trying and seeing if that gets you closer to your goal. And if it doesn't, change the numbers some more. If it does, then you add, you stack on some new filters, basically inch your way closer to the final output, which is gonna be something like just a bunch of dots on the screen. And that's basically gonna be your goal for this assignment. We have our uh, first part, which is gonna be filtering out a single white die. And our second part is gonna be uh, taking two colored die, uh, two colored dice and uh, trying to count the number of dots and add them up. Uh, as for like actually printing that out, uh, in the first assignment, which is why we said to, you have to do assignment one first, we had you guys set up like SSH access. Uh, after you do that, you will be able to actually set up your, your um, set up your pi such that it sort of forwards the, um, just, we're gonna try to like make sure that works for everyone, but basically you'll be forwarding the screen like the display of your Pi onto your computer, so you can just view it from your computer directly. And that should allow you to actually see the output of your camera and like your different filters and stuff. Uh, so yeah, that's basically assignment two. The entire spec is linked on the slides and I'll post it in an announcement after this. Are there any questions about that? Cool. And if that's all we have, yeah, that's yeah. all we have for you today. Um, if you want to stick around and talk about convolution. 
Or if down. you want to stick around and not talk about convolution, that's yeah. also fine. Um, <coughs> but yeah, uh, we're going to have a work session again on Sunday. So Where come if you want, like, help so working with... Um, I, would, I would especially recommend going sure. for building the... the I'll probably get the graph. Okay, you know, scary. we got, like, tools there, uh, tools in the lab, and also, like, some of the stuff is kind of tricky. So uh, if you want to... Yeah, if you haven't done that by then, I'm yeah. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Guys.